Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up? And welcome to Social Jello with Angelo podcast. I'm here today with Aaron. Oh man, Aaron, I should have verified your name before I got started. Aaron Dodson? Got it. Oh, okay, good. So far, that's last three episodes. I'm three for three. <laughs> Getting better, man. I'm trying. <laughs> Seven years of doing this. I think the last three have come out okay. <laughs> so Aaron is a Kajikimo practitioner. Aaron, where are you coming out of? Coming out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Oh, okay, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And... um. You're coming from the, uh, I hope I don't mess up. Are you coming from the Ordinance branch? I'm from the Ordinance front group. It's the OKO. Um, I've been with the OKO for quite a long time. Uh, I've also uh, trained with other uh, Kadri Kimbo instructors. Uh, as we talk, I'll, I'll bring them up later. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Aaron, this is your origin story. So this is going to be titled, uh, I'm not sure yet. How I'm not sure what I'm going to title it yet. I'll, once we get done talking, I'll figure out some catchy title to get people to try to watch it. But for anybody watching this, if this is your first episode, I interview a martial artist from around the world. I'm coming out of Japan. I practice Kajikembo myself. So I have a lot of Kajikembo guys on the show. And we pretty much just talk about their martial arts journey. So, Aaron, let's just get started here. When did you start training in martial arts? I started training martial arts when I was about six years old. So my first martial art was uh, like freestyle wrestling and Greco-Roman wrestling. Oh, that's pretty cool! Freestyle wrestling was that um where was that at? Was that was that through a program or at a school? Club, uh, like little league club uh, wrestling. Uh, I've done wrestling all my life since uh, I went from Little League uh, to high school to college. I wrestled all through. And then I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I do like to try to catch up anyone who might not be familiar with your style. You So you were doing freestyle wrestling and Greek-Roman wrestling. Is that correct? And what would you say are the difference between those two styles? I have an idea of it, but for anybody who doesn't know, what's the difference between, because I was explaining this to my wife once. She was watching the Olympics and I was like, oh, that's freestyle wrestling. Oh, that's Greek Roman. She's like, what's the difference? And like, even I, I mean, I'm not a wrestler, so I was like, probably my best to, to butcher the rules. But what is like, what is the difference between those two styles of wrestling? Freestyle wrestling came from old catch and can wrestling. From, but it's, Catches can wrestling had more of the submission holds back in the day. And then when it became an Olympic sport, they had to take away some of those uh, uh, submission holds, like neck cranks and leg locks and arm bars and those type of things. So freestyle is, uh, you would say, it's like the son of that uh, catches can wrestling. That's what it developed into. So. It's more like collegiate wrestling. Uh, freestyle is more of uh, it got different roles. Um, there are a lot. They base things on a lot of uh, stand up, a lot of takedowns, a lot of throws. Uh, you can touch below the waist, going for le uh, the legs, uh, and locking a takedown that way and taking someone down, and then. Uh, during Greco-Roman wrestling, it's all upper body. It's like no gi for like judo. There's a lot of upper body locks, uh, arm throws, head locks, those kinds of things. All right, cool, cool. I, I, I like that breakdown. That's that's actually less complicated. than what, Whatever I told my wife, she was more confused than we're done. <laughs> so... You did wrestling throughout your, your since you were a kid. Um, what was the next style that you ended up getting into? I ended up uh, just to like take a break between wrestling. It's grueling and it's 
uh, so my father put me in uh, a style known as Tong Su Do. So that was m one of my first um, kind of uh, experiences with actual like martial arts, punching and kicking kind of combo. So I did Tong Su Do. I worked my way up to the belt ranks. And I uh, achieved a high red belt in the Tang Soo Do system. And can you tell me a little bit more about Tang Soo Do, uh, where it came from? I know you already mentioned like how, what it looks like. So I'm guessing punching and kicking, um, but a little bit of where it came from and what that style is. Part of uh, our Kaju Kendo uh, our family tree also, Peter Chu. Um, he was a, uh, he got taught by his uh, father. Uh, Tong Su Do really is, uh, it's a Korean art. It takes a lot of uh, like forms and things from Shotokan karate. Because the occupation by the Japanese and from the 1900s through World War II, they occupied Korea. So um, they put their blend of things on things. So it kind of held back the, the Koreans at the time. So they had to learn Shotokan karate. A lot of you see a lot of the forms in Tang Su Do. Some of the forms look like Shotokan forms. So after the occupation, uh, Tang Su Do, the Tang Su Do guys got together and they formed the Tang Su Do Mudo Kwan uh, Federation. And then they ended up calling their system. A lot of the uh, Tang Su Do came from uh, Korea and Northern Korea up through from China, Manchuria area. That's where we get the Chinese China hand came from. And, and how old were you when you started Tang Sudo? I didn't ask that. Sorry. I was started in 89, so I was like 13 years old. So you started doing Tang Sudo, you worked your way up to a red belt. Um, I'm not sure how the ranking system works in Tang Sudo. Can you break that down real quick? Kind of like karate, yeah, they go from white, white belt, yellow belt, uh, green belt, blue belt. Uh, then you have your brown belt, red belt, and then black belt. And then once you get into the higher, uh, like your grandmasters and things, then you would have a midnight blue belt where they, they go by. So you got to Red Belt in Tang Soo Do. Um, and then what happened from there? I would have stuck with Tang Soo Do. But my father was in the US military. So I was able to uh, move around the country a lot. So that's why wrestling was so awesome. I can find a wrestling mat anywhere. You know? So. Uh, uh, so when we moved, uh, I had to find find something else. So I would have stopped with Tong Sudo and got my black belt. But I don't have control of the situations when I was a kid. And so my dad said, hey, we're moving. Pack your shit. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so uh, we ended up, I ended up, um, we ended up in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we went from my Washington D.C. to Omaha, Nebraska. That's a good change in the scenery from big city life to Plainfield. <laughs> but um, I ended up when I was there. Uh, I started wrestling again through high school, and that, that we call high school wrestling. There is folk style wrestling. It's kind of like collegiate wrestling, what you see in college. 
And how, and again, I'm just going to assume that whoever's watching might not know what, how that works. What would you say is the difference between folk style wrestling and the other two styles of wrestling you mentioned earlier, Greek, Roman, and freestyle? Folk style uh, wrestling is, uh, you got more, you got more, you got takedowns, uh, and then it's uh, when you pick somebody up, you gotta set them down. You can't just uh, pick them up and you know chuck them. <laughs> you have to come down with them. So, uh, but some of the rules are different. That's all. It, that's all it is. It's uh, if you would look at like catch wrestling from the submission guys, catch guys, the folk style guys are uh, kind of a breed of them. Uh, and the collegiate guys are about the same. Because it all came from that. All right. So it's more similar to the wrestling that... A lot of it is. A lot of it, a lot of it is control. And controlling so taking down taking someone down uh and controlling them while they're on the ground so what's good for like mixed martial arts is uh wrestling uh, you can dictate where the fight goes based on uh, how good you are in wrestling you can control the stand-up game and the clinch or you can uh, defend the takedown and keep it on your feet if you want to and punch it out like Chuck Liddell used to do. And then you can also take people down and uh, you end up you can be like uh, you know, like Kevin Randall men used to take people down and punch them from the ground and pound. But, but uh, wrestling dictates where everything goes. You have to have a good wrestling base to be effective in any kind of uh, uh, self-defense, uh, MMA, or you have to have that base. It's one of the top bases for any kind of martial art is wrestling. And when you were wrestling, did they, um, did you end up competing like for the team or anything or were you just practicing? I competed uh, most of my life in wrestling. I did. I took second multiple times and a couple, of, you know, in high school, I took like seconds like a couple of times, a couple of years. Two years, I came in second, and then my, my senior year, I was in my third place. Awesome. Awesome. So at this point, you're still a teenager, right? Like, so in our, in our story, yeah, you're still, you're still a teenager. You're finishing up high school. Uh, when I was there in, um, when I was there in Omaha, uh, a couple of my buddies were in, into martial arts. And they said, hey, come check out this, um, this club. And it was, it was under RBWI. Warrior Intensive uh, Training Branch. It was run under the King of Combat, the Robert Buzzy. I ended up working in uh, training out of one of his affiliates there in, uh, in there in Omaha. He was a the teacher was a police officer, and I was able to uh, go there once a week and got to train and. Uh, that style, uh, they were doing like ninjutsu at the time. It was, it was real popular back in the like, 80s and 90s. But, um, but they were modernizing their techniques to like one of their guys is uh, uh, Steve Jenham just like fought in the UFC, was one of the first ones. You know, it was early 90s. So they were modernizing all their techniques to MMA. And uh, you, if you can give me a real quick, I, you, you said RBWI, is that right? Warrior Intensive Training Grant, I, I believe. Oh, okay. 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 So you, you did that for a while. 
Um, and at this point, you're finishing up high school. You're more like finishing up high school at the time. And where'd you end up going from there? Um, my dad ended up uh, moving back to Kansas, and uh, he got a he got a job with the aircraft company. Uh, I followed along with him at the time and ended up going to junior college there in Kansas and I did competitive wrestling at the time in college. And then after I did my uh, wrestling in junior college, I ended up uh, uh, going into a career. After that. So you were wrestling throughout college. What were you studying in college? You said you went into a career. What, what career did you end up going into? Uh, criminal justice in college. Ended up doing uh, public safety. Uh, uh, my job now, um, I had several jobs uh, when I was uh, throughout, the, throughout my life. But, Right now, uh, I've been doing 20 years for the U.S. government and uh, fired emergency service. And that's, you have to forgive my ignorance on this one. So you work as a, you work with the fire department? I work as a firefighter and okay. also as a paramedic working the ambulance. And oh, awesome. Awesome. Specialized rescue. Oh, cool. So you were wrestling through all college, <clears throat> finish your career. Um, what other martial arts did you end up getting into from there? Uh, my grandfather's, I forgot to bring this up in the early beginning. Uh, uh, my Filipino grandfather. Was uh, with uh, scout cavalry, scout cavalry units uh, during the World War II in the Philippines. He was part of the Macaw Hill Scouts, so they would do uh, basically recon for uh, Macaw Hill, go out and check where the Japanese were. Uh, my grandfather at the time was a uh, a boxer. He fought uh, uh, at, in the uh, lightweight division in the uh, military services, uh, all the military services in the 1940s at that time. They, uh, they all fought in like uh, big tournaments and things like that in boxing. So if you were a champion at that time, you were pretty, pretty, pretty good. So, uh, but that was before the war. Um, when the war happened, uh, he was also trained in the Filipino martial arts uh, with uh, with the blade and also uh, with the with the sticks and the swords. But yeah, he. He fought against the Japanese uh, when they invaded the Philippines. He was captured at Bataan. He was involved in the Bataan Death March, which he was uh, taken to a, it was a brutal death march. And when a soldier fell out, the Japanese were not a waste of bullet on him. They were men at them. They were denied food and water. Uh, so they were marched to a, a prison camp, Camp O'Donnell. He was, he later uh, escaped from that prison camp and became part of the uh, guerrilla, guerrilla movement in the Philippines. He was a guerrilla commander coordinating guerrilla activities in the Philippines and Luzon until MacArthur returned. So 
a lot of the, the Filipino martial arts was applied in combat. So I was able to uh, learn a little from my grandfather through his boxing and his Filipino martial arts. Uh, I still do Filipino martial arts to this day. Along here. And on my grandfather's side, on my dad's side, on the American side, uh, my grandfather was a golden gloved boxer during the 1930s and 40s. Uh, he always he always uh, held mitts for me and taught me how to box early on. And that's awesome from what my grandfather done done for me. Yeah. Those are my two grandfathers. They're pretty awesome. Yeah, sounds like it, man. Sounds like it. And so you got some boxing early from them. And it almost sounds like I, I, I know a little bit of the. I don't, I'm really bad at the styles, but um, just generally they've been calling it FMA lately, which is just kind of a generalized term for what Arnis, Eskrima, and all, you know, just to kind of Filipino martial arts, FMA for anybody who's watching. Um, and then been into war. So, oh, okay. All right. So that, uh, it was a standard system that was uh, part of like the Bolo battalions back in the Philippines. So a lot of those guys were learning that system. Can you say the name of that system one more time? The war. The Balinta war system. That's what he uh, trained them. All right, that was, I'm going to see if I can pronounce it. Benitwa system, is that right? Benitwa. Okay, all right, cool, cool. So now going back to where we left off, so it sounds like, <laughs> to connect the dots, uh, you had a boxing base somewhere along the line, right? It's very At a very young age. Young age. I could throw hands back when I was 70. <laughs> <laughs> you had, and you had some golden gloves boxers uh fam you know family members holding the mitts for you at a very young age and you were doing freestyle wrestling greek style wrestling um moving forward uh collegiate wrestling wrestling college competed did you compete in college too or no you didn't call the shots but... okay so you're competing in wrestling in college as well did some tanks Sudo for a little bit um before you got into college wrestling you start your career when did you end up getting into Kaja Kembo? It's kind of a crazy kind of story. Kind of thing. Like, I love martial arts, yeah. but one of my styles of wrestling was Samba. I was uh, big in the Samba for many years, uh, internationally also in Samba. Uh, it's combat Samba that I, that I did. It's like MMA, gloves, headgear, chin guards, uh, when you follow the jacket, like in Utah. That's what we call a kurta. Uh, I fought in uh, Sambo. Uh, when Sambo was around at that time in the early 90s, it was starting to take off. Yeah, that's it. Right in here. This is Sambo. Combat Sambo is where the guys with the headgear and things. And, uh, it, it's like MMA. No holds brawl, pretty much. You can punch to the face, uh, you can headbutt, and you can kick in the nuts. So, and then the guys that like competing in like in like the judo format, it's kind of like the judo format, but it's uh, the sambo wrestling. The sambo wrestling is part of it's like um, it's like judo with uh, with the rule set is a lot different. Who can grab longer on the belt? Who can uh, leg lock? Where you can't do that in judo. And, um, there's a lot of different. Uh, grips like grabbing gripping grip fighting type stuff is a lot different from judo they're a lot less uh 
And that one would be the, like these girls over here. That's the Sambo wrestling. I got into Sambo wrestling. It was during the AAU. We used to do, uh, during freestyle wrestling, it normally took place at the summertime. So we um, started wrestling like in the summer, like, like in high school, we wrestled, would wrestle in the summer and we had the AAU season. When I saw these guys one time in the early 90s wearing these jackets, and they were like, I was like, what are they doing? That looks like martial arts. That looks like judo. You know, and I was like, I wouldn't do that shit. So um, and one of the guys I came walked up to and asked him about it. I was like, yeah, this is Sambo. And uh, this is the third, basically internationally, it's the third recognized uh, uh, wrestling forms of uh, wrestling because you got freestyle greco-roman then you got samba wrestling so i said yeah i want to do that so i ended up doing that for many years i ended up uh competing and then uh, working my way up throughout the years and then, and then i ended up getting my master of sport in the soviet union and Combat Sambo, coaching license to uh, coach. Um, and I have my own club. Well, yeah, I was I'm, thinking right, right now, Khabib is like your number one spokesperson for Combat Sambo right now. Like, <laughs> that's, he's, he's pushing. He's literally carrying that sport internationally right now. So uh, if anybody who's not keeping up with the UFC um, or doesn't watch mixed martial arts, not, I don't assume that you do. Um, if you don't, <laughs> you can look up a guy named Khabib. He has combat Sambo. Um, he just murdered uh, Conor McGregor when they fought a while back. And yeah, it's a, it's definitely uh, if if you don't know what it is, it's definitely a martial art that you should keep an eye on and check out. Um, it's really interesting. I love the idea that in combat sambo, and I, I like MMA rules and everything, but I love the idea in combat sambo that you got the judo gi because of the grips, right? You're kind of combined because I mean you can do Brazilian. And I do, and I'm not I'm not trying to make any uh, what's the word I'm looking for. I'm not making any comparative statements here. Um, and like I was telling you earlier off camera, I try to own everything I say. <laughs> I liked it because um, it had more of a self-defense um, feel to it. Um, when I did, I used to do BJJ also. But it seemed like I spent a lot of time on my back. And as some of those, as we learned in Kaju Kimbo and the other styles that we might have uh, trained in, being on your back on the street ain't a good idea. You want to get up as fast as you can. You know, have multiple attackers. You got multiple people coming from God knows where. So with the, with the gloves and the, the, the rule base and, and combat sambo, you got the jacket, you know. Because it, 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 you can grab it like a judo game and you can toss a guy, throw him down, and then go for a fast submission. Most of the submissions in combat sambo come from off the throw or off the takedown. So they're quick. You hit the submission, you get back right back up. So it, it, helps, it helps out in self-defense system. And yeah, like I said, I mean, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I have a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? So like, it's not like I, I dislike one or the other. Um, but one thing I did notice was, like you mentioned earlier, because of the idea that you can grip, right? Well, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's only grappling. So they're not going to wear the, if they do decide to do MMA, quote unquote, sparring, you're going to take off the jacket and you're going to go straight into MMA sparring. So now you've totally taken out the idea of the grips, which is kind of a shame, right? You spent so many years in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu developing your grip strength to grab that gi. And now you're going to do MMA where you don't even have a gi anymore. You got to start learning more of your catch wrestling and, and grappling holds and, and stuff that's coming more from freestyle wrestling to keep up with it. Um, well, well, where combat sambo already has that. And it already has that idea, like I said, that street fighting element where if you were to get in a fight, there is no rule that says I can't grab the shirt 
right? There is no rule that says I can't get a nice grip to hold it down. So that, that's, that's what I thought was really cool about that style. So you, did, you got into combat, Sambo. <laughs> How old are you when that happened? I was in... Uh, that was my college years, so you know, like 18, 19, 20, 21, and then I just kept doing Sambo all the way up to um, I'm 48 now, I just stuck with it. So, you're doing combat, so you did, so again, we're, we're still putting together your puzzle here, so <laughs> we're going back to your story here. If I have your timeline right, uh, you got into college. You started doing collegiate wrestling and on the side combat sambo. Um, you get through college, you start your career, and um, what happened from there? Uh, how did uh, and all way into the background? You already have a boxing base. In fact, you have a lot of the elements of Kaju Kembo here. Um, you have a lot of the elements already kind of going on there with the tank sudo and everything. So when you finally, because everybody has a different story. Um, for example, for me, I, uh, I wasn't looking for Kaja Kemba when I found it. I was, I was looking for, I was actually looking for a, a Jeet Kune Do school. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's always surprised about that. They think I'm like, I was one of those people that as a kid, I did not, I trained on my own mostly. And I read a book, I read Bruce Lee's book and I was, I didn't want to join a school. And I, I spent a lot of, my instructor gave me a lot of shit for this. I spent a lot of time dojo challenging before I would join so I'd always ask to come in for during a sparring night. And if I didn't like what I saw, I wouldn't join. Um, I ended up finding Kaju Kembo that way, but I wasn't looking for it. In your case, and, that, and again, my background, just a lot of training, cross-training with people, not in a dojo, at a park, in a garage, people with black belts and other arts. And I never wanted to step inside of a dojo. Um, I had a bad experience when I was a younger 16 or so. I had a bad experience with a, with a Kung Fu school. And I kind of just brushed off formal training um but in your case you came in and you already have all these elements you already <laughs> you have boxing you have freestyle you got combat sambo you have a lot of the stuff that's already kind of there so what was your impression if i guess two questions would be a two-part question um what school did you end up walking into what country came school and who did you meet and then what was your impression of the art beings that you kind of came in with all this other stuff before you got there it was about 2000 when I first uh, uh, got into Kaju Kimbo. And I've been with Kaju Kimbo ever since. So I took a little break of absence from that and I competed in uh, uh, mixed martial arts. Uh, you know, I had a couple fights in the cage. Other than that, um, since 2000, I've been boxing. Um, how it, like you said, how how we get into things, and it was by just by luck, really, that I got into Kaju Kimbo. Was uh, I've I studied like uh, Chinese Kimbo before that, like after college. I found a school and I got into some Chinese Kempo and I ended up getting my black belt. But I was going around and they had a Filipino martial arts seminar. And I, I went to that seminar. And one of the guys that was doing the seminar that day was a senior grandmaster. Dan Frage. And Senior Grandmaster Frazier is from the uh, Al Reyes uh, lineage, more of the Kimpo lineage. And he ended up getting his black belt under Richard Peralta from Texas. So it's the Aldu Reyes and the Peralta system, which is Grandmaster Frazier's system. 
which is uh, Kajikimbo with the M, Kajikimbo with the M self-defense system. Uh, I ended up um, training with Grandmaster Fraser for uh, many years. We had a good good relationship. I uh, helped him uh, teach classes to uh, at that time when I went 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 to train with him. I I already was a black belt in Chinese Kimbo. So he said, "Just come on in. You'll learn the art. And it's very simple." So, he goes, I'm bringing you in and you can start helping. So at that particular time, I started studying with Grandmaster Crane and we had a good working relationship. I started teaching his kids program. And then I also started teaching the adult program at his school. Uh, on days that, that he needed a, a break from teaching, I would help my grandmaster face. But I, I put a new spin on it. Uh, at that particular time, uh, I ended up, uh, I was really getting into Cotton Kendo at that time, really doing good things in the school. And, I ended up having my, trying to develop my own system. Uh, Kaji Kembo combat grappling was kind of my uh, kind of my started going kind of my flavor. So we did a lot of things in class that were resembled um, the pit's philosophy. How the pit would be for training, a lot of stand-up, a lot of takedown defense, uh, a lot of punching from kickboxing standpoint to, uh, I didn't spend, I didn't get, I did train with the kids twice a week, so I didn't spend a lot of time uh, with them at the time. Uh, and doing their form course and I let Grandmaster Frazier handle that. Um, but I did all the other curriculum, like the MMA curriculum that we were putting together. And, uh, and we, well, we worked that in together. And while you're doing all this, you're also working through the uh, I think the Alu the Alu Reyes Kajukembo Brancher. He's with the Kajukembo Self Defense Systems Branch. Oh, okay, okay, Kajus. But their lineage goes through the the Reyes and the Peraltas. Okay. All right. So it goes through the Reyes and Peraltas, and so at that time you're going through through that Kajukembo system with him. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Kajukembo. The forms, punch counters, and grab down, everything that's in Kaji Kim. Club, defenses, knife defense, all those stuff. And, and then um, I'm not trying to get too sidetracked on this topic, but I got to bring it up. <laughs> Was it uh, the forms? Were those like the Palama Pinon sets? They were the Palama sets. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. My my school does the Palama sets. They. No, 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 I'm not gonna. Okay. I'm not making any qualitative statements here. <laughs> I just say like every school. Me, me and John Hackleman have had, <laughs> have been having an online, ongoing debate <laughs> about Pinyon Palama and punch tricks for the last two weeks, and I think we're going on three weeks soon um on that topic. That's why I don't want to <laughs> go down that rabbit hole right now. But I, I am gonna say that. So you you went through the Palama sets. This is the kind of curriculum that you're going over. And anybody who's watching it is not a Kaja Kembo person, just to kind of catch you up in hopefully a minute, because I don't want to drag this too long. Um, 
different Kajikembo schools, different lineages do have very similar looking movements, systems, forms, but sometimes we have a little bit of a difference in the names and sometimes our numbers don't match. So like if you were to look up, for example, Pinyon number one, Palama number one, it's funny, I got together with a Gaylord guy who trains out here in Japan and we, he did his Pinyon set number one, I did my Palama set number one, and we can kind of see the similarities and differences. Um, so it's not, we're given the freedom to do pretty much, once we get our black belt, we get given free reigns. The, whether it steps on other people's toes or not is a different story, but we are kind of getting free reign once we have our black belt, which is why you'll see such a variety um, if you were to look up online and you type in Kaja Kimber, you can see such a variety of different things coming at you. Um, but sometimes there will be similarities. And one thing that you can, that, well, I hate to make generalized statements, but you could, I have like a 90% certainty on this one, is if you start looking up at Palamas and Pinyon sets, you'll see a lot of similarities in that. Um, yeah. the, the numbers might not be the same. So maybe what's happened before, I met up with another guy, he's like, oh, this is my Palama number one. And I show up my Palama number one. They're like, oh, no, that's my Palama number three. But like, so like, maybe the numbers won't always match, but it's there. Maybe someone switched the numbers around somewhere along the line. And it, it happens. It's it's a, it's a been around for over 50 years. So this is the kind of stuff that happens 50, 50 years down the road. Um, so going back to your story, you're going through the Kajikembo system. You're teaching classes. You're, you're working on kind of an on a combat system, bringing in a lot of MMA elements. In your story... You have a lot of MMA going on. I mean, I, I know like modern MMA is shirtless in a cage, which which I've also done. Um, but pre pre modern MMA, I want to argue sambo. If you're doing combat sambo, you're doing something that's very 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 similar to the rule sets that you're going to encounter in the cage a little later, and the and the grips add even more to that. Um, so you're you're bringing that into the curriculum. How did, uh, because we're almost getting to the end of our hour, so I'm just going to fast forward here. How, how did, what were your impressions? Like I said, because I think I kind of mentioned that, but I'll, I'll ask you again. What were your impressions of Kajukembo? Because at this point, you've done a lot of different martial arts. Um, when you saw Kajukembo, what was your impression of it? I love it. I mean, I said it's like, because it's, I was looking for a Sambo school, you know, but when I got with Kaju Kimbo, I was like, it brought in all those elements that I've already been knowing for all my life. You know, some of the things, uh, and Grandmaster Fraser's school, he did more of the, uh, he's heavily involved with Kimpo. There's a lot of the old fashioned Kimpo striking, um, he did a lot of work with Ed Parker and some of the other greats in the past. But why I loved it, it broke it. It's a, it's a mixed martial art in itself. Um, he did more where a person can specialize, where when Grandmaster Fraser was great at was at his Kimpo, his fast striking. He was unbelievable fast. He hits you from anywhere, and then you go home and you got bruises all over your body. It's like, damn, it hurt later. So um, I wanted to become specialized also. Um, and I started, I took a break from Kaju Kimbo, ended up coaching uh, mixed martial arts uh, for a lot of, uh, for a club here in town with a good friend of mine who was a UFC fighter, Matt Grice. Love that guy to death. But, uh, we end up uh, having a little club together and we uh, trained uh, mixed martial arts fighters for, for a couple of years. What was his name again? Matt Drives? Matt Grice. 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 How do you spell that? G-R-I-C-E. G-R-I-C-E. 
Oh, okay. Is this uh let me just make sure I got this right here. Uh, I'm gonna pull them up. Is this is this who we're talking about here? All right, there he is. All right. So you're working with Matt Grice. Um Grice at the time and uh, he was fighting in the UFC with also. I was able to train train Matt Grice also with his uh, martial arts and, and he had a he had a career ending uh, car crash. Ended up putting him out of the UFC. Mm -hmm. He almost lost his life. I'm glad he's with us to this day. But, uh, I ended up working with him for a few years. Um, his club ended up um, moving from a new from to a new location here in the city and um, I decided that I wanted to do get back into Kaji So uh, I said, hey man, I had a great time with you guys coaching all the fighters to UFC, Bellator, all, all the big fight organizations we were a part of and being a coach and helping these young guys see their dreams come true and all that stuff and mixed martial arts. but. I had some unfinished business, so I wanted to get back into, you know, Kaji Kendo. At the time, I tried to get back with Master Frazier. Um, Grandmaster Frazier ended up uh, retiring from civil service out here at Central Air Force Base, and then he ended up uh, selling his his school, and he ended up. Um, doing missionary work overseas. So uh, there was no Haji Kimbo school to go back to. So I so thought that was kind of a bummer to me. So that's where I found the Ornaz organization, the OKO. So I contacted Grandmaster, Great Grandmaster Grant Graw. And I said, I would like to join your organization. It was my lineage. And he accepted me. And I became a student and great grandmaster of the OK. And uh, they got a great organization. They helped me tremendously in Kaji Kimbo. With, I, I use their curriculum now. I follow it. And I teach my own students that I have. I have my own little school here. It's in my home. It's in my garage. I have about seven students, but they're dedicated. They work hard. They train every day with me on the days we have training. And they love Kaji Campbell like me. So, but yeah. Uh, the OKO got some great curriculum for anyone out there that is interested in Kaji Kimbo. Uh, so I started uh, corresponding with those guys in Hawaii and working with all the curriculum, getting and doing my testing uh, with those guys. So then I started building my own, uh, my own. Hawaiian Kempo system from what I've had before. That's my Hawaiian Kempo system with uh, an N instead of an M. So, and a lot of the philosophies come down the same as John Appleman's uh, system. It's a lot of uh, MMA based, Kaji Kempo, uh, self defense oriented. A lot of it's with. My Filipino background, the Filipino martial arts, we do a lot of uh, knife and stick uh, training. Uh, we go to the range, we go shoot. Like everybody, you might not like firearms, but you never know when uh, firearms will be brought to the table. So you got to be a master of all weapons. 
weaponry is what will kill you in the long run. Uh, a knife, somebody pulls a knife, you better know how to take that knife or, or you better know how to use that. Uh, and I'm heavily involved uh, with the Tenza College Training Group. I do a lot of uh, Holly through that organization, Keon and Paula Lapenza. He's a great instructor and he's a great mentor with, with me and my son. So I've been heavily involved with them for a long time. So we're almost getting close to our wrap up. And I have uh, two questions, real quick. Um, because I don't know enough about the Orden as Kaju Kimbo branch. They're coming out of Hawaii, correct? Coming right out of Hawaii. Uh, for, was at, at the time, um, Grandma, uh, Grandmaster Ornez uh, wanted to establish his own system. Right, his, his, he always he was already a co-founder of Kaju Kimball, but he wanted to have people under, you know, and uh, he wanted to appoint a, a, a successor. A lot of these other organizations, as a CJO, he maybe not have wanted a successor. I don't know. I don't want to. That's a big can of worms, right? Yeah, he officially. Because I was there when before the seizure passed. Um, I was at one of those last meetings. He did not want a successor. He wanted a, a board of directors. But um, the uh, ordinance branch, that is, you have a success. Okay, you have a successor. And then that came from the guy, if, I'm, if I can kind of remember this, because I, I talked to Mitch Powell about this. And maybe I'm going to do a separate podcast to go into the history for this, because he's, he's the best guy to talk about it. Um, that's Uncle Frank, right? Uncle Frank, yes. Okay, right. so in the Kajikumbu community, they call him Uncle Frank. And then he came directly f under Sijo. He's one of the people like in that, like you got Godin. Frank, Frank Orton is in that box in the top there, right? Orton is in that top box. Yeah, yeah. So there's, so those for those of you that don't know, we have this thing called the Kajikumbu tree on the top. You have this like box of all like the original students from Hawaii that trained right under the people that founded Kajikumbu. And Frank Gordon is one of those people. Now, I don't, this podcast is not about that. Maybe on a different day, uh, <laughs> he could come on with a historian, paperwork. I like to do it that way. That way, if anybody gets upset about something said, we're like, hey, we're showing up documents as we're talking, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, but uh, I just want to get like a quick brush on that. And then my next question might be a little controversial, and I will just throw that out there. <laughs> before I even ask you the question. And if you don't want to answer it, you can say no comment. And I respect that. But um, what are your thoughts, man? You're coming from a mixed martial arts background. I want to make that very clear. You're coming from a mixed martial arts background. You started in boxing. You're not one of those people, not to, again, I'm not making a value statement here. If you're one of those people that did you come your whole life, I love you, I, I love you all too. You're all my ohana. But in your story, you're not one of those people that came that way. You came from wrestling, boxing, a lot of the foundations of MMA, combat sambo. You fought in the cage. You worked with UFC fighters. You worked at a UFC, uh, like a, not a UFC gym, but you worked at an MMA gym that produced MMA fighters in different. You know, you're not some guy who just sat there doing forms all your life or anything. And again, if you love doing forms, nothing against that either. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to cut the fat here real quick. Um, what are your thoughts on that as someone who actually did MMA, someone who actually fought in the cage, someone who actually came from a mixed martial art background? What are your thoughts about this newer generation of MMA guys who tend to kind of shit on Chinese Kempo and Kempo in general? Like, they, <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. It's just what's happening. Like you said, a lot of people talk shit online and we could, we could look. I'm not gonna say oh boy, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to walk around this grenade here. <laughs> There's some pages that me and you both know where a lot of people talk shit. But and then people get upset about that. But I, I don't just follow Kaju Kembo pages, I follow different martial arts pages. And that little dialogue is happening all across the internet. All across the internet, there seems to be a lot of videos. In fact, people making fun of Kempo guys, specifically Kempo guys, 
and they're MMA guys. They're guys that come from an MMA background, such as yourself, such as myself. I, I'll, I'll include myself in this conversation. I told you earlier, I didn't do Kaja Kemba my whole life. I did other stuff. I trained with people that were fighting in the cage. I trained with people. I've been, I've done kickboxing. I've been a kickboxing coach, MMA coach. I fought, you know, I've come from a very similar background. And I don't have a problem with Kempo guys. I really don't have a I see it as, hey, that's what you'd like to do. Maybe sometimes I'll have a disagreement about the application, but that's between me and I kind of keep it to myself. Maybe it's, uh, I'm 41. Maybe it's, I don't know if there's a generational thing happening here. What are your thoughts on this newer generation? I don't know if it's newer generation guys, because I've seen other MMA guys see this, but what are your thoughts on those, some, some of those MMA guys that tend to shit on some of the traditional arts or traditional approaches? And hopefully we're going to wrap this up. So I'm going to hand over the floor to you and let you say what you're going to say. I'm going to shut the fuck up now. <laughs> well, it's a real controversial uh, type thing. But um, a lot of these guys, uh, I think, don't respect the other art. Um, if you participated in some of those arts that we talked about this last hour, if you have some kind of base in those arts, you'll have some kind of understanding about them. You can learn from anyone. You just have to be humble. Being humble is uh, always keeping your cup, your cup empty and fill it up with knowledge. Okay, be a sponge. Absorb everything that is useful and get rid of stuff that is not. That's been my whole philosophy of my whole life. If something doesn't work for you, don't shit on it. Just say, hey, it doesn't work for me. It might work for this other guy. So, I tend to, you know, give everybody a free, like, give everybody a, like, what I'm trying to say is I'm trying, I will give everybody a fair opportunity to showcase their art. Because you've got some unbelievable Kimpo guys out there, you know, you got some unbelievable Kaji Kimpo guys, you got unbelievable wrestlers, you got unbelievable, you know, Filipino martial arts out there. So everyone you, you will meet has something to offer you. Don't shit on them. Don't talk crack, trash until they can give them a shot. You know, I don't think anybody's talking crap about John's guy. You know, Hawaiian Kimpo guys in the, uh, in the cage have proven themselves to be world champions. John just went away, went around the tradition. He's still traditional, but he mixed in kind of what I've done to make him his system really effective inside that cage. And it shows. He's produced Chuck the Dad and Globe. And those guys were at the top of the food chain. They were the number one guy for many years. So for these guys to say, hey, Kempo doesn't work. You know, some of the, some of the stuff, yeah, it looks like slapping, but are you really slapping a guy in Kempo? No, you're actually chopping a guy. You know, those are hard, fast strikes you're applying to vital nerve area, to the throat. Well, some of these things in MMA, we can't attack. Like in Kaju Kimbo, we're going to attack the eyes. You know, we're going to rake the eyes, finger jab the eyes. You can see that in MMA with uh, John Jones, he liked to do. He did that to Glover a lot of time in his finger. But uh, the things are, you know, I think you, you should be humble. And learn all you can because this is a short life that we all live. And one thing what this one guy might show you might save your life. You know, 
So that's the way I, I, I think. Everyone has something to learn. And if you're a martial artist, you, you should respect everyone that's out there. I know there's some guys out there that probably disagree with me. I get it. Some guys out there are full of themselves. And they, they got to where they're at because they're con artists or something. We all see those guys. We need to see the guy with all the stripes on their damn neck. So, one thing I can tell you that I earned everything that I ever got. I worked my way up, put in the work, I put in the time. I'm always constantly on the grind, working hard, training, bettering myself, helping my community, bettering others. Well, I show up and I keep coming. I have goals, I'll set goals, and I'll keep continuing those goals. I recently got promoted to Seagong in Kaju Kimball. I never thought that would happen. But I kept progressively working hard, continuing with the grind that I learned from wrestling. And kept grinding, kept grinding, kept my nose clean, kept working. Added new things to the program, whatever. Learn from different people. Absorb what is useful. Discard what you think is stupid and get rid of it. It didn't work for me, so I'm not going to use that technique. I'll adopt that technique and make it better for me. I hope that all makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. <laughs> So we are out of time, but I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Um, we kind of talked about that earlier, just train. And um, I don't like to answer my own question because it just sounds tacky. But I will say that you can appreciate both, right? I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to be, um, I, can, I can see the differences in what i do and what someone else does and i can appreciate both for what they are and they don't they don't they don't have to it doesn't all have to be what i do so like when i see stuff online it doesn't have to be the same and if it's different that's that's their thing um so yeah i think that's a really good way to, to wrap things up i think this is just put in the work and grind um before i wrap up here aaron is there anything you want to promote a uh, school a website a seminar anything like that no oh, i scratched that not the seminar part because if i tell you a seminar and you give me a date i'm going to screw myself over on a deadline so i'm going to say is there a website or, or or a school or anything that you want to throw out there before we, we finish up uh i have my own school uh here in oklahoma city oklahoma um it's the OKO. I'm with that branch of Kaju Kimbo. So my school here is the uh, Hawaiian Kimbo uh, school here. Uh, and we practice on Monday nights for about two hours. People want to get a hold of me. Um, I have a web Facebook page that I, I do. Uh, I have a combat samba web page that I put on Facebook. And you guys can. What's the name of that? Oklahoma City Combat Sambo uh, Combatives. Let me, let me type that in real quick. Oh, Oklahoma City Combat Sambo. Is that right? Combatives. Combatives. Let's see. Let's see here. Let's see if this is yours. 
Okay. I'm going to bring up, is this it right here? Here, let me share. Is this it? Am I? Let's see here. Is this it right here? Uh, Filipino, uh, the tens of brothers and sisters that, that are in that place. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, if you look up Oklahoma City Combat Sambo Combatives, I Googled it. It came right up. So there it is. Um, if you want to check out what Aaron's doing, work as a group on Mondays, you find yourself in the area drop on in all right aaron thank you so much for meeting me in this virtual space <laughs> all the way from oklahoma in japan i really appreciate you taking the time to share your martial arts story and then for my listeners um i released one of these about i try to do i've been saying once a month lately it's been once a week if i keep that up i'll keep doing that if i can't don't hold me to it uh <laughs> just depends on my schedule I also teach martial arts while doing this podcast and have all that other stuff. So I try to get it all in there. So please be patient with me. All right, brother. Thanks again, man. And I'll catch you all next time.